we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you because you brought us here so you can develop your people, the character of Christ in us, the charisma of Christ in us, the courage of Christ in us, and the vision of Christ in us. We're asking, O oh Lord, that tonight you speak to everyone. We pray that our hearts will respond properly to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Everything we need to hear, everything we need to do with what we hear, you grant us the grace to do them in Jesus' name. Amen. Empower us for greater service for your kingdom. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Philemon chapter 1, just one chapter. I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. And then from verse 23 and verse 24. Philemon, from verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, a brother, unto Philemon, a dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Apaya, and Archippus, a fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. We come to verse 23. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. And Marcos, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. In those four verses I've read to you, verse 1, verse 2, verse 23, verse 24, you'll find some words there. Look at the last word in verse 1, fellow laborer. Look at a similar word in verse 2, fellow soldier. Look at verse 23, fellow prisoner. And look at verse 24, fellow laborers. That's teaching us something, telling us something about the work of God, about the kingdom, about the ministry, about the responsibility the Lord has committed into our hands. The Lord's work is so great and so mighty, and God's work in any church, in any ministry, is so big, and it's bigger than any single individual minister. However talented that minister may be, however gifted that minister may be, however spiritually equipped that minister may be. And you'll find that in this chapter, it's talking about the necessity of partnership in ministry. And the necessity of joining hands together, joining efforts together, joining everything we have together so that we can do the work he has given us to do. As you look at the whole of the New Testament, you are going to find these words, number one, fellow laborers, number two, fellow soldiers, number three, fellow prisoners, and then you also find fellow helpers, you find fellow servants. You find fellow workers, and you find fellow heirs, you find fellow citizens, and you have yoke fellow. Everything pointing to the fact that if the work of God is going to be done, and if we're going to achieve the purpose of God and the plan of God, if the work he has given to the ministry, to the church, that we need hands joined together, talents coming together, and all the things we have coming together so we can do the work he has given us to do. Look at your local church. The pastor alone there in that local church cannot get all the work done. Look at the whole ministry in your region, in your state, or the whole ministry in your group. The pastor there cannot do just everything. That's why we have all these uh, fellow laborers and fellow servants and fellow uh, helpers, and we're going to do the work. We'll do it together in Jesus' name. And tonight we're looking at those verses and we're looking at this topic, the partnership of fellow helpers in the ministry. The partnership, the fellowship, 
the coming together, the uniting together, and the handling the work together. You bring your gift, I bring my gift. You bring your talent, I bring my talent. You bring your skill, I bring my, my skill. And as we all put everything for the work, and we sacrificially labor for the Lord, we know that the work will be done. It will be done in Jesus' name. But it's going to take everyone, every hand on deck, every harvester there, every reaper there, every preacher there, every person that is doing something for God in that place so that we can do it together, partnership, fellowship, communion together, and then getting everything together and moving forward in the will of God and the way of the Lord. Kingdom work is so great, greater than any strong, mighty worker. It is necessary for all the ministers in the church to be in fellowship together, in partnership together, in unity together, in oneness together for purposeful God or danger ministry. In fact, the Bible tells us very clearly, divided we fail. If we're divided one against the other, you are, you know, plowing this way, another person is scattering the other way. You are lifting it up, another person is bringing it down. You're going this direction, the other fellow is going the opposite direction. We're going to fail. But when we're united and we walk in the same direction, and we're following the same plan, and we're following the same blueprint, and we say this is the way, and everybody is going that same way, by the grace of God, we're going to succeed. Did I hear an amen from the church? Amen. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 25. Matthew chapter 12, and we're coming to verse 25. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, here is what it says. It says, and Jesus knew their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking because he had done a great work. A miraculous work, a sign, a supernatural thing. And then the unbelievers there and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were always there. The people that did not believe in the manifestation of the power of the Lord through the Lord Jesus Christ, always looking for something to hold him for. He knew their thought. And look at what he said. And he said unto them, Every kingdom, whatever the kingdom, whether the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of Satan, or even the kingdom of God, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to, tell me up there, desolation. That is, any church that fights against itself, any ministry fighting against itself, and any kind of a work, and the people there, the workers there, the leaders there, instead of laboring together, instead of working together, they are contradicting each other, they are opposing each other, and they are criticizing and pulling down each other. It says every kingdom, you can even say every family, you can say every department, you can say every section, and you can say every local church, you can say every ministry in the region, in the state, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. That means then, uh, as we look at the writing of Paul, the apostle, by inspiration, and he was writing to this, uh, Philemon, just one letter, just one epistle, just one chapter, and he's saying that this is the work we're going to do. And I'm writing to you for this purpose. Then he begins to mention that we're reaping together, we're laboring together, we're serving together, we're sacrificing together, and it is that togetherness and unity that we're fellow laborers together, we're fellow prisoners together and we're fellow servants and we're fellow helpers together. That is what gets the work done. No wonder Jesus prayed for the unity, the oneness, the togetherness of his own disciples, of the people he was going to hand over the work to. He tells us in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, and I'm reading from verse 21. John chapter 17, verse 21. It says that they all may be one. How many of them? How many of us here? I said how many of us are to be one? That they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be, tell me, one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. 
What's the purpose of the ministry? To make the world believe. What's the goal of the ministry? To make the world believe. That is the sinners in the world. To believe that the Father had appointed Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, and is the only Savior, and is the only one that can take our sins away. He's the only one that can bring us out of darkness and bring us to the light. He's the only one that can bring us to the Father. And how is the world to believe that we who are disciples, and we who are pastors, and we who are workers, and we who are leaders, that will be one. And then you look at verse 22, it says, And the glory thou, hast, thou gavest me, I have given them... Why did he give us glory? What's he giving us his honor? What's he give, giving us his favor? Why are we favorites in the kingdom of God? He says, the glory which thou hast given me, I have given them, look at the purpose, look at it, that they may be, tell me out aloud, one, even as we are one, that we, that the church of God, that the laborers may be one, united together. And he says, that the Father and the Son are united as the son is united with the father there's no time you'll find any disagreement between christ and the father anytime you'll find disagreement between christ and the holy spirit and it says as we in the trinity the godhead in heaven as we are one that the people who are laboring together that will be one because that is going to give us the victory and the success and the productivity that the lord actually wants for church look at verse 23 i in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one disagreeable spirit does not make us perfect it is when we're united with him christ the head of the church and we're united one with another it is then that perfection is going to come it says i in them that is christ the savior in us he lives within us so that we can have that life of the redeemed and that life of the ransomed and that life of the saved soul i in them and thou in me that they they may be made perfect in one. It says that the world may know. That's the purpose that the world may know. If we actually want to see the fruit of our labor, I want to see the result of our preaching and the result of our ministry and the result of our sacrifice. That unity is very important. That fellowship is very important. Coming together, working together, pulling together, going in the same direction. It says that's important that the world may know that thou hast sent me and that thou hast loved them as thou hast loved me. I pray it will happen. I said it will happen. And every one of us will be united together so that we become fellow helpers in the ministry, in the great work he has committed into our hands. We're looking at Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Philippians chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 27. He tells us here, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, still emphasizing the unity we ought to have as we're fellow helpers, and we're fellow laborers, and we're fellow servants, and we're fellow citizens, and we're fellow, um, fellow workers in the vineyard of the Lord. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand, look at this, that ye stand fast in, tell me, one spirit with one mind striving together for the face of the gospel. One mind, one heart, one purpose, one spirit, one goal, one direction for the preaching of the gospel, striving together for the face of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm looking at verse 3. Ephesians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 3, the unity that ought to exist in the midst of the children of God, in the midst of the servants of God, in the midst of the helpers and the reapers who are reaping the fruit of the world and then bringing souls into the kingdom. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the faith in the bond of peace. Endeavoring, striving, trying. 
and doing everything you have to do and subjecting your own ego, bearing your own ego, denying yourself or whatever you might have wanted to say, wanted to do. If you know that will bring division among the people who are serving the Lord, it says that you endeavor, you strive, you do everything in your power, beyond your power by the grace of God to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Why? Because there is one body, but form, and there is one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Look at verse 5, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Look at verse 6, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And then he goes on to say, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And as we're going to make use of those gifts for the kingdom of God, the unity is very important. And that's what helped the early church. That's why the early church was what? It was Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 31. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 31. It tells us about that early church, saved people, sanctified people, united people, walking in the same direction, doing what they ought to do in the spirit of unity and fellowship and partnership so that the purpose of God will be realized by them. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were gathered together. Can that happen again today? I said, can that happen again today? You know, when you pray and all your heart is there, your mind is there, your will is there, your consecration is there, everything you've got is there, you forget about yourself and you forget about what you left at home, you forget about everything and then the word of God is so important and the work that what you do is so important that you put your whole heart there and when they had prayed, the place was shaking when they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Thank God it will happen again. And they speak the word, how? With boldness. I said, how? We're not even united in responding. I said, how? In boldness. And look at verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. You see that? The multitude of them that believed. The leaders were united. The apostles were united. The disciples were united. The members were united. No wonder they took over the early world. They that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. In verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace, great grace, great grace was upon them all. May the Lord do it in our midst again in Jesus' name. We're talking tonight on the partnership of fellow helpers in the ministry. The partnership of fellow helpers in the ministry. Partnership. The partnership, the fellowship, the cooperation, the communion, the koinonia, the fellowship and the partnership of fellow helpers in the ministry. Now, as you would see, that those uh, words appeared in Philemon. But you find that in other parts of Scripture. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, reading here from verse 23. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper. You see that? You're, you're asking of Titus. Yes, I sent him to preach. He's also available to go to any other place. Is anybody asking of Titus? Is my partner? We have partnership together. And fellow helpers concerning you or our brethren be inquired of they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of christ look at third john the third epistle of john only one chapter two and here we're looking at verse eight third epistle of john and we're reading from verse eight it says we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Don't pull down. Fellow helpers. Don't distract. Fellow helpers. 
Don't divert attention, fellow helpers. Don't decrease the power, the strength of the people who are laboring for the preaching of the gospel and bringing in of the souls into the kingdom, fellow helpers in the truth. That's why it's very important for you, for me, to consider tonight the partnership of fellow helpers in the ministry. The Lord will do it in our lives. Effective in our lives in Jesus' name. We're looking at three points. Number one, distinctive obedience of seasoned fellow servants in the ministry. Distinctive obedience of seasoned fellow servants in the ministry. Point number two, deadly obstacles before soft fellow laborers in the marketplace. Soft fellow laborers in the marketplace. Deadly obstacles before them. Point number three, divine ownership of sanctified fellow helpers by the master. Divine ownership of sanctified fellow helpers by the master. Point number one. What's your number one there? Distinctive obedience of seasoned fellow servants in the ministry. Let's come back to Philemon. And I'm reading from verse 1 and then verse 21. Philemon chapter 1, just one chapter. And then we're reading from verse 1 and verse 21. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, look at how he describes him, a dearly beloved and fellow laborer. A dearly beloved and fellow laborer. What did he expect from Philemon? As he's writing to Philemon and he says, You're a brother, you're a beloved brother. Not only that, you are a fellow laborer. What was he expecting? Look at verse 21. In verse 21 he says, Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. He says, I'm writing to you. I'm uh, kind of inspiring you to do this. I got the message from the Lord and I'm giving it to you. Why am I giving it to you? That you'll do something about it and you'll do exactly what I want you to do. In fact, I know you're going to go beyond what I've told you to do. Obedience. You see, united servants, fellow servants, thrive on obedience. If we're going to succeed in the work of God, the thing that makes us to succeed is that we're united together. One mind, one heart, one doctrine, one purpose, one goal, and one direction. And we're obeying the word of God and we're obeying what the Lord has commanded us to do. This unity, division, disobedience will break down instead of building up the ministry, doing the work of God, the work of the kingdom, pursuing the same goal, everybody, inspired by the same Holy Spirit, everyone, and aiming at the same result, that is the salvation of souls and the security of those souls and the growth of those souls. We obey the Lord and we obey our appointed leadership. We obey the Lord and we obey appointed leadership. For Titus, Paul was the only apostle. Yes, there were other apostles, but those apostles were in Jerusalem and they were in charge of other people. But for, for Titus and for Timothy and for Silvanus, Paul was their apostle and they looked up to him and they were obedient. And now as Paul the apostle was writing to Philemon, he says, you know what? You know what I'm writing to you? I have confidence in you that you're going to be obedient to what I tell you and you're even going to do more. And it is that, that obedience, it is that, that submission, it is that, that yieldedness, it is that hearing the word and obeying that word that shows that a person is a fellow helper, is a fellow laborer, is a fellow servant, and is a fellow citizen of, a citizen of the kingdom of God, and is going to the place he's talking about, and the place he's preaching about. Paul, the apostle, was confident that Philemon would obey as expected. 
In fact, he said, I'm even expecting that you'll go, you'll go beyond what I'm telling you. Obedience is productive and it pleases God. Obedience on the part of a worker, on the part of a leader, on the part of a preacher, on the part of a soul winner, on the part of a Philemon. Obedience pleases God and it is productive. Disobedience displeases God and disobedience is counterproductive. It's like we do not know if you are not obedient to the word of God. If you are not obedient to leadership, it is that we do not know where we are going and why we are here, why we are being trained and why we are working for God because it just it destroys everything we are trying to build and it displeases God and it is counterproductive. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 4 and I'm reading from verse 7. In Colossians chapter 4 verse 7, here it says, all my stage shall take a cause declare unto you who is a beloved brother listen to this a faithful and a faithful minister and tell me the rest there fellow servant in the Lord not fellow servant of the Lord but fellow servant fellow servant with us we have the same heart we have the same mind we have the same goal and we have the same doctrine and his fellow servant with us in the Lord. Look at verse 8. Whom I have sent unto you. And Tychicus did not say, well, I'm not ready to go now. You sent me to this place the other time. That place the other time. Where you're sending me now, I'm not ready. He said, whom I have sent unto you. You know, three people cannot send one person. You cannot say, okay, you send the other time. I'm going to send now. There's an apostle. There's a leader. And that leader that God has appointed, anointed, and he put in place, he says, Titus, go there. Timothy, go there. Tychicus, go there. Onesimus, go there. That's how it works. And if it is when we allow that to work and we're united together, that the work of God will prosper. And thank God this work will prosper. I said the work of our hands will prosper. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your state, your estate, and comfort your heart. And look at something here. Look at something here, verse 9. It says, ways, tell me. Tell me out aloud. You know, if you only read one part of the Bible, you will, you know, you'll, you're going to be led astray. You know, Onesimus, he was writing to Philemon, who had been his master before. When he was a sinner, and the fellow ran away because he has done something wrong, and then now Paul the Apostle wrote to uh, Philemon. He said, I'm sending Onesimus to you. I want him to settle with you. If uh, he owes you anything, charge that to my account. I will Pay, I will repay you all. And I have not told you how much you owe even your life, your spiritual life unto me. But uh, let him come to you reconcile. After they reconciled, uh, Philemon released to Nisimus, even to Paul the Apostle, because he was more than his servant. Now that's why you have this verse 9. Look at verse 9. With Onesimus, a fellow, a, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, and then he says, a day that is Tychicus and uh, Onesimus, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. They'll make known unto you that his Onesimus now was even preaching the word and telling what was happening. If you have any uh, in the Bible that writes some, you know, little note at the end of the epistle. That is at the end of verse 18. You see what is written. Anybody has a Bible that has, uh, you know, some small lettering uh, written there at the end of uh, verse 18. Anybody there? You raise up your hand if uh, your Bible is like that. Okay, read what it says over there. I can't hear, I can't hear what you are saying. You are talking like, uh, you know, you are not in church. Let somebody stand up and read that. Uh, take it slowly. Reaching from... Uh, you see that? Reaching from Rome by Paul the Apostle. And it says, by... Tychicus and uh, tell me out aloud. 
only see must you see there are people that read only one part one section of their bible and they'll not read the rest that's the reason why we need to read read the bible read the bible and understand that this man now became also a fellow helper only see must he became a fellow liberal he became a fellow servant and i pray that the lord will help every one of us in jesus name i'm reading to verse 11 and it says aristocles my fellow prisoner saluted you and marcus sister, sister son to barnabas touching whom ye receive commandments if he come unto you receive him and jesus which is called just us who are of the circumcision these are only these only are my tell me fellow workers unto the kingdom of God which have been a comfort unto me. And so you see that these people, they all helped in the work of the Lord. Like you are going to help in the work of the Lord. You are going to assist in the work of God. As we are gathering together, you come along and then you use your gift, you use your talent and everything you've got and we gather together in Jesus' name. We're looking at Romans chapter 6 and you'll find here, it was talking about the obedience of Philemon. And it's talking about our obedience too. We need to be obedient. Obedience shows that we have the grace of God. Obedience shows that we're called of God. Obedience shows that we know where we're going. We know why we're here we know why god has called us and we know why god has called him and why god has called the apostle why god has called our leader why god has called the overseer and that leader that apostle and that overseer is leading us you go there you go there you go there i want to drag in our feet obedient 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 to the instruction that we are receiving and this work will prosper in our hands it will prosper in my hand I say it will prosper in my hand. It will prosper in your hand in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 17. It says, But God be thanked that she was servants of sin, but she have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. That was the joy of the New Testament church. And that was the strength of the New Testament church. That there was obedience, obedience to the word, obedience to the words they were receiving. And I will not try to give 80% obedience, 85% obedience. In fact, it says they gave more than 100% of obedience because it says, I know that you're going to even do more than I have written unto you. Look at chapter 16 of Romans. Romans chapter 16 and we're reading from verse 19. Romans chapter 16 we're reading from verse 19. In Romans chapter 16 verse 19 here is what is telling us and it's about obedience for your obedience is come abroad unto all men. See that. Your obedience that is you are so obedient to the word of God is even come abroad unto all men. Everybody is making the remark those uh, deeper life people obedient 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 to god obedient to the word of god obedient to leadership if they tell them this is where to go exactly that's what they go this is what to do exactly that's what they do this is what to preach exactly that's what they preach and they're obedient and it says your obedience is come abroad unto all men i am glad therefore on your behalf but yet i would have you to be wise unto that which is good and simple innocent concerning evil when they mention evil you are innocent you are not there you are not a participant of evil deeds but all your life and everything you've got you give to the obedience of the world in it says in the philippians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 12 philippians chapter 2 reading from verse 12. Look at what the Lord is telling us. And it is still talking about being obedient to the word and uh, giving ourselves to the word. And we're not uh, detracting from the word, subtracting from the word, and then trying to, you know, please sell part of the time, please the world part of the time. We want to please the Lord. That will be done here on earth as it is done in heaven. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as she have always, always, always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more 
in my absence. That's how you know those who are born again, those who are real children of God. You see those who are not born again, they try to obey while you are there, while you are looking, while you'll be able to detect that one is disobedient, that one is faithful, that one is unfaithful. They try to please the leadership. And, but you see those who are really born again and those who are called into the ministry and they're called to the work of God yes in our, in our presence they obey they're not trying to prove I can disobey I'm a man of myself I'm a man of my own will I'm a man of my own thought no that nobody is trying to prove anything and now in our absence in the absence of the leadership it says you even obey more look at that verse 12 it says wherefore my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I pray we'll obey the word of God. Somebody is still there. I say we'll obey the word of God. First Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 14. First Peter chapter 1, verse 14. As obedient children... What kind of children should we be? What kind of children am I? Of child am I? I say, what kind of child am I? I'm talking about you. What kind of child are you? Obedient child. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy. So be ye holy in, tell me, all manner of conversation because it is reaching be ye holy for i am holy why are we holy because it's holy i said why are we holy because it's holy look at verse 22 seeing ye have obeyed ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth ye have purified your souls you're saved, you're sanctified, you're purified, you're poured, you're cleansed, you're sanctified, and you are circumcised. It says it will show forth in obedience. You'll be conscious of the glory of God. You'll be conscious of the life that a child of God should live. You'll be conscious of what offends the Holy Ghost and what will grieve the Holy Ghost. You'll be conscious of what will please the Heavenly Father. And because of that, you're saved, you're sanctified, you're purified, you're poured, you want to obey the Lord seen ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love or pretending love or hypocritical love of the brethren see that she love one another with a pure heart how fervently first Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 first Thessalonians chapter 3 I'm reading from verses 1 and 2 it tells us in verse 1 chapter 3 verse 1 it says wherefore when we could no longer forbear we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and send Timotheus our brother and minister of God and our, tell me, fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to, est to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. You see this Timothy sometimes in Ephesus. Another time go to Corinth and then now go to Thessalonica. And the Timothy was not, uh, you know, grumbling and saying, uh, uh, Paul, it looks like before you see me every time, you just lay hold on me, go here, go there. I've not even settled down. I've not settled down totally in Ephesus, and I'm not settled down totally in the other place you sent me to. And you, you know the problem in Corinth now. You sent me there, and I have plan, and I have all these things I want to do. And then you call me again, you say there, I've not heard about the Thessalonians, and I want you, Tim Timothy, to go there. There's no complaint. You see, when we're working together, if the Lord is leading the leader to you know send you here send you there send you everywhere then that's the leading of the lord and the working together being fellow helpers and fellow servants and we're fellow helpers in the gospel will mean that i'm ready to go anytime thank god i'm ready somebody there i say thank god i'm ready you are ready and the Lord will use you mightily in Jesus' name. We're looking at Romans chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 21. Romans chapter 16. And we're reading from verse 21. Romans chapter 16 verse 21. In verse 21, look at what he's telling us here. He's saying, Timotheus, who is this? I said, who is this? Tell me how he qualifies him. 
my fellow, my fellow, uh, my fellow uh, worker, the work fellow. He says, Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and then he mentions other people. Timotheus again, and he's writing to the Romans now, and he's saying, Timotheus, uh -uh, Paul the Apostle, what's the matter? You are going to run this man to you until he becomes totally weak. He's here, he's there, he's there, and he's recommending him again now to Rome, and he's saying, is my fellow worker. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. I pray you'll be like this. I didn't hear your amen. Somebody there is afraid to serve God. Is afraid to be a fellow helper. Is afraid to be a fellow worker. Is afraid to be a fellow servant. You will be. I said you will be. And this work will prosper in your hands, your hands together in Jesus' name. And when your Paul cannot, you know, go here and there, thank God you are there. Am I seeing the person who is there? And then when he says, you go there, you go there, thank God, I back my load. My load is packed already. I'm ready. I am going. I said, I'm ready. I am going. And then when your friend comes and he says, why did he send you to again? Why is he asking you to go again? He said to go there, to go there, to go there. He said, no, don't bother me. I've laid everything on the altar. And because I've laid myself, my soul, my life, everything I've got on the altar, anywhere duty calls, I'm going to get there in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen over there. In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm reading verse 17, for this cause have I sent Unto you, Timotheus, Timotheus again, who is my fellow son, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Somebody will become a Timothy. I'm looking at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 19. Philippians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 19. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19, but I trust. And this is not to Philip. I, you know, we were seeing Timothy over here. Tesnica, St. Timothy over there, Ephesus, St. Timothy over there, and that is Corinth, and now we come to Philippi, and he's writing to the Philippians, he says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send, tell me the name, Timothy shortly unto you. He didn't even have to take permission for Timothy. He didn't have to say, Timothy, I hope you're still strong. I hope you can still do this. And uh, I hope you're not mine. I hope your, you know, your friends will not, uh, you know, kick against this one. He says, but I'm going to send Timothy unto you that I also may, may be of good comfort when I know your state. Look at verse 20. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state for all seek their own not the things which are Jesus Christ but I pray that but will mark your life will be stamped upon your life all people they are going down the drain and they are backsliding and then they are resistant they are disobedient and they are disunited they will not they will not accept they will not go but when it comes to you there will be a big but and heaven will record that in your favor in Jesus' name. Look at verse 22. But she know the proof of him that as a son with the father, he has served with me in the gospel. As a son with the father, he has served with me with the gospel. Paul, why are you telling us this again about Timothy? You are talking to a Philippine now. He said, I'm saying that because of verse 23. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently. Him therefore, you therefore, he hopes to send presently. And you will go. And you will succeed. And the work of God will prosper in your hand in Jesus' name. Togetherness, togetherness, unity and partnership and fellowship so that you become a fellow helper, a fellow harvester, a fellow reaper, a fellow servant, a fellow worker, and you are a fellow servant of the Lord, willing to do whatever it is there is to do, you will not be tired. 
you have the same time, the same number of days, and the same 24 hours of the day, like other people, God will give you wisdom to divide your time, and to apportion your time, that whatever it is, God has appointed, I will do, and whatever it is, God has appointed, I will be, in whatever way, he wants me to be a helper, he wants me to be a servant, he wants me to be a reaper, he wants me to be a soul winner, in whatever way, whatever it will demand, thank God, I am ready. I say, thank God, I'm ready. It's not word of mouth. It's coming from the depth of the heart. I say, thank God, I'm ready. Somebody don't bend down. Don't hide your face. Lift up your head and say, thank God, I am ready. You'll be ready in Jesus' name. We're coming to, we're coming to Philemon chapter 1. Philemon chapter 1. And I'm reading now from verse 24. Philemon chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 24. And this is a point number 2. Now, deadly obstacles before soft fellow laborers in the marketplace. Look at uh, Philemon chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 24. It says, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, tell me the rest, my fellow laborers, my fellow laborers, my fellow laborers. We're talking about Demas now. He was a fellow laborer to the, uh, to the apostle Paul. But look at Second Timothy chapter 4 and see what happened later. What happened later. I pray this will not happen to you. Look at this. It tells us in Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 10, for Demas Tell me, as forsaking me, why? I mean, Lord, this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica. Hold on, hold on. There was a problem in the church of Thessalonica. And this man was not available to be sent to Thessalonica. And Paul had to send Timothy. And Timothy was already having his hands full because he was to be at Corinth. It was to be at Philippi. It was to be at Ephesus. And Tesnaika was there. And this man, if you knew, you, you, you knew the way and the road to Tesnaika, why didn't you go to Paul the Apostle and said, I, I'm, I'm free. I can go there. I can do this work. And there's just one man. There's just one man running here and there. And this man, he forsook Paul the Apostle. And he forsook the Lord. He forsook the truth. He forsook God. He forsook the great commission. Demas has forsaken me having lodged this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica. That's what we're talking about. A deadly obstacles before sought fellow laborers in the marketplace. In the marketplace, the marketplace is the world. But this man, he had a straw for backbone. He was sought. The wind blew, he was so soft. And you could press him like this and everything would be depressed because he was a soft man. His mind was soft. His heart was soft. His will was soft. He was flexible. He was unstable. You couldn't depend upon him. He was so soft, he didn't have the grace to be solid and to stand. God will give you grace. So that whatever wind is blowing, whatever opposition is coming, you will stand in Jesus' name. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. You see that problem? Loved this present world. This is what happens to people who do not love the Lord above everything around them. Matthew chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. There's something in Tosnaka that attracted him. And that thing weighed on his heart more than the call of God. You see, there are people, there are some things in the world, the pleasure of the world, the praise of the world, the politics of the world is so high in their esteem and is so great on them. They love that thing more than they love the great commission. And those people eventually, they forsake the Lord. Matthew chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 30. Seven. Matthew chapter 10 verse 37. It says uh, in Matthew chapter 10 verse 37 
He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You see, there are people that they love, you know, somebody, a close relative, and that close relative is not sold out to the Lord. That close relative is not totally committed to the Lord. That close relative does not understand the great commission. That, that relative does not understand the call of God. And they love this person so much, father so much, mother so much, and daughter so much, and son so much, and these relatives so much, they love them more than they love Christ, more than they love the kingdom of God, more than they love the great work the Lord has committed into their hands, and those people, they're like demons, and they're going to get away from the calling of the Lord. Matthew chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 12. Matthew chapter 24, and we're reading from verse 12. Here it says, here are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 24, and we're reading from verse 12 it says and because iniquity shall abound tell me what will happen the love of many shall wax cold as they go to their place of work in the marketplace as they sell and you know the people that you know the use for if you don't pay that money if you don't pay money to serve idol we're going to carry all your goods and everything iniquity abounding and uh, you know if you if you know you want to really sell the time you are going to sell much is when the bible study is when they fix bible study in your church if you're going to do business do business if you're going to be a pastor be a pastor and then when they put the pressure on you because iniquity shall abound the love of many shall wax cold now they have reasons why they cannot attend retreat they have reasons why they cannot attend bible study they have reasons why they cannot go here they cannot go there everywhere is dangerous the corner is dangerous the avenue is dangerous the street is dangerous iniquity has abounded and that has affected their love the love of many shall wax cold and this is what happened to demons. Thank God it will not happen to me. I say thank God it will not happen to me. Look at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 19. Mark chapter 4 verse 19. And the cares of this world. The cares of this world. And the deceitfulness of riches. And the laws for all the things. And training choke the world. And it becometh unfruitful. You see Demas was following Paul the apostle. He saw his zeal. He saw his sacrifice. He saw the imprisonment. He saw everything. And he saw the gift of the spirit in the the life of Paul the Apostle. But all of a sudden, some things began to enter the cares of this life. Another certificate. The cares of this life. Another business deal. The cares of this world. Another trip to Japan. The cares of this world. Another trip to China. The cares of this world just coming in, coming in. You couldn't resist that. Money, the desire for more. The desire for the things of the world coming in. Therefore, you couldn't stand that. And it says because of the deceitfulness of riches and the loss and the desire, the inordinate affection for other things entering in, it will not bring the fruit to perfection. Thank God I am free. I say thank God I am free. And let's look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 43. John chapter 12. We're looking at verse 43. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. In John chapter 12 verse 43. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Demons. He began to, you know, see people. And as he was listening to the news, he saw, that fellow was my classmate. And now everybody is praising him. He's exalted in the world. It's like, you know, he's gone that portion, that portion. I was more brilliant than that young man. I was more brilliant than that lady. And look at that person. Now everybody is talking well of them. He got into politics and now see his position. He got into business, see his position. And the praise of men caught him. And then everybody is putting on Paul the Apostle. Everybody is a kind of denigrating, uh, you know, Paul the Apostle, who is see a prisoner, who is see and this and that. And then the Jews were against him, and because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God, that's when he, that's how he went back. You might appear fervent today and aggressive today. You're evangelistic, you're running here and there. 
if the praise of the world catches up with you, and then you begin to see, my name ought to be there, my name ought to be there, I want to win an award there, I want to get this and get this there, eventually you'll be like demons, and you're going to backslide. I pray you'll not backslide. And the sin is to close the door against the love of the praise of the world, so that by the grace of God, you'll love God more than every other thing. And love God more than whatever it is that is beckoning to you in the world in Jesus' name. We're coming to uh, John chapter 21. John chapter 21. I read from verse 3. In verse 3 it says, Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. I go a fishing. Something was happening now because the Lord had called Peter and eventually now Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He had appeared unto them in chapter 20 and now he said, well, I'm, I'm reconsidering about my consecration, about my sacrifice. I'm reconsidering. That's how it begins. That's how it begins. For demons, that's how it began. Consi reconsidering you know, what I laid on the altar. Reconsidering what I gave to the Lord reconsidering all the vows I made to the Lord. I go a fishing. Look at verse 11 there. In verse 11 it tells us in verse 11 what happened Simon and uh, Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes and hundred and fifty and three and for all the, all there were there were so many yet was not the net broken. But look at this verse 15 uh, so when they had died, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Keep on counting, you know, 100, 150, 153, big, big uh, uh, pieces of fish. And then Jesus is saying, I go a fishing, now you have your fish. And then look at all this, and it's the blessing of the Lord, because Jesus said, throw your net there, and they threw their net there, and they caught multitude. And Jesus said, now, you have, you have to make a decision, now. make up your mind now, Peter, lovest thou me more than all these, that's what happened to demons. He saw all the things that, you know, his energy could bring, all that business could bring, all that Tessanka could offer him. And then the love for those things he was seeking for in Tessanka weight more on his heart, grew more in his heart, and was high on his heart. Because of that, he couldn't stay, and therefore he forsook the Lord. There you are today, we we'll see you there today. But are there things in the world that are pulling you? Are there things in the world that are drawing you? That the Lord is asking, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch your heart. Watch your affection and watch your love. Lovest thou me more than these? The Lord is asking you. And I pray you give the right answer in Jesus' name. We're looking at 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we're reading here from verse 10. It says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. Demas. That's it. That's what happened. The love of money is the root of all evil. He saw that there were opportunities in Tasmania. If I go over there, I will, I will not be living like, you know, living on the charity of the people and living on, you know, what the people give and living on, you know, what, uh, whatever may be available uh, from anywhere. But I'll be a man of myself. I'll be a woman of myself. And I'll be able to, you know, live big. I have a big dream. I have a big kind of a future and this is what I'm going to do and the love of money came in I want to get more, I want to get more, I want to get more and the work of God he lost the work of God I will not lose the work of God the opportunity God is giving God has given us, we're not going to lose in Jesus name but it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have pierced, the, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and, uh, and meekness. We're coming to Second Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
verse 1. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, over here he says, See, no, he said, it is what I deceived these people. He said, This know also that in the last days, perilous time shall come, for men shall be, tell me, Lovers of their own selves, lovers of their own selves. They must begin to look at himself. Look at the way I am. I think I should be doing something better than preaching. I should be doing something better than traveling around with Paul the Apostle. I should be doing something better than being in prison there, in prison there. Look at me and look at my talent and look at my ability. Look at what I could achieve. Look at where I could be. And because of that, because he was a lover of himself. Uh, look at uh, look at uh, verse four. In verse four, it says, "Straight us, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God." That's why people backslide. That's why people go away. That's why people kind of recollect all their vows and all their consecrations. And they say, I don't think I can follow that anymore. I don't think I can go that direction anymore. That's what happened to demons. I pray it will not happen to you. We're looking at uh, Second Peter. Second Peter. I'm reading from chapter 2, verse 15. Second Peter, chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 15. Second Peter, chapter 2. Here we're reading from verse 15. It says, uh, which are forsaking the right way and they have gone astray following the way of Balaam the son of Bozo who loved, who loved, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, the wages of unrighteousness, you, you see there are people that are, you know, walking here they're walking there, they're walking over there and you see that the people are even receiving lower salary than they are receiving, they're writing better cars and they're buying lunch and they're building houses and they're wondering how did you get that, I'm even here that he's gone to that other place is already building his laying foundation for that is uh, having a private uh, business there is having another is even building a clinic can you think about it and he's earning less salary than i'm earning and then he says i know what they're doing i know what they're doing and then he says okay i'm serving the lord and the thought will come another time the thought will come another time wages of righteousness that they you know get this and get this and snatch this and you know change that other receipt and everything it says eventually well i will repent later i'll call upon the lord later because i cannot just remain like this look at my condition this holiness holiness deeper deeper and deeper life is uh, you know i'm just like this thank god i'm not a beggar thank god i'm living all right but look at all these people that are behind me and then they're going beyond wages of righteousness when you love that it makes you to be like a demon and then you go away from the Lord and the Bible tells us very clearly love not the world and that the things that are in the world if any man loves the world the love of the Father is not in him I pray the Lord will protect you it will preserve your heart so that all those things that are making people to go astray like demons will not have any effect upon your life in Jesus name uh, we're coming to Revelation chapter 4 chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and here the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. He says in Revelation chapter 2 and he says in verse 4, he says nevertheless I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Because thou hast left thy first love. Sometimes you will not know. Sometimes uh, somebody is uh, actually is, uh, going back but he doesn't know. And gray ears are here and there. He's not looking at the mirror of the word of God. So he does not see. He does not see that his consecration is going down. His love is going down. His excitement in the things of God is going down. His sacrifice is going down. His vow is going down. He knows too much of the Bible now and the much of the bible he knows actually makes him to drop his first love he says i know i don't have to make a vow i know i don't have to consecrate if i don't tell god i'm going to do that then i'm not under any obligation i know that salvation is by grace and it's not by works i know that jesus has paid it all he uses the bible against consecration he uses the bible against sacrifice he uses the bible against going forth and preaching the gospel he says i know that uh, you know you don't get to heaven because you're a preacher yes i 
I hear that. I hear that. The person who preached to you, if he also quoted that, I don't have to preach the Bible. I don't have to be a preacher. I can go to heaven without preaching. How will you hear the word of God? He's using the knowledge is God against his consecration. And now his love has gone down. And Jesus said, I have something against you. I have something against the way you're using the Bible. I have something against the way you're trying to make yourself to be at ease. He says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast led thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove the candlestick out of its place except thou repent. I pray God will give us the spirit of repentance so that everything we laid on the altar before will still be on the altar. Our time will be on the altar. Our life will be on the altar. Our talent will be on the altar. Everything we've got, our love will be on the altar for the Lord Jesus in Jesus' name. Second Peter, Second Peter, I'm reading from chapter 2. Second Peter, chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 20. Second Peter, chapter 2, verse 20. For if after you have escaped the pollutions of the world, think about Demas. He, first of all, he escaped the pollutions of the world. He was saved. He was a follower of Paul the Apostle. He was a fellow laborer. He was a worker. He was a preacher. And he was a, a fellow traveler with Paul the Apostle. But now it says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. I pray that will not happen to you. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have no need to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them for it is upon unto them according to the true proverb the dog is turned to his own vomit again and they saw the pig, the swine that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. You see in the case of Demas, the world had a strong irresistible pull on him. The God of this world had different baits and hooks and he was caught. I pray the devil will not catch you. Demas had something in his heart that the God of this world could appeal to and pull him away. He loved something else more than God. He loved something else more than Christ. He loved something else more than the truth. He loved something else more than the ministry. And that's what became his downfall. And I pray that this will not become your downfall. That there will be nothing on earth, nothing in the world, nothing in the marketplace, nothing anywhere that you love more than God or love more than Christ or love more than the truth or love more than your calling or love more than the ministry in Jesus name you see the Paul the apostle said this man loved the present world the present evil world look at James chapter 4 James chapter 4 we're looking at verse 4 it says ye adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God you know it's not just that well I didn't backslide I didn't go to commit this. I didn't go to commit that. It's just that I cannot, uh, you know, go on with that pace anymore. That uh, kind of speed was too much for me. And I cannot do that anymore. It says as he went back like that, and he loved this present evil world, he said that he became an enemy of God. Whosoever, therefore, Demas or any other person, whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world, is the enemy of God. I pray you will not be an enemy of God. You will not go back to the world. You know what pure religion is in James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Reading from verse 27. James chapter 1. Reading from verse 27. Here he tells us about pure religion. And it says uh, pure religion. And undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. And to keep himself. Tell me out aloud. Unspotted. 
from the world, unspotted from the world. Actually, the Lord Jesus Christ has told us we need to count it, count the cause, count the cause. He tells us in Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 8, reading from verse 36, Mark chapter 8, Demas, think about this. Backslider, think about this. The one that was committed, consecrated to the Lord before, but now he's pulling back and he's drawing back. Think about this. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world, the whole world of pleasure, the whole world of profit, the whole world of selling and buying, the whole world of banking, the whole world of finance, and the whole world of politics, and the whole world of popularity, and the whole world of position. It says, what shall it profit? Profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? I pray the God of this world will not blindfold you. The God of this world will not pull you back. The God of this world will not draw you down. I will not drive you from the calling the Lord has given you in Jesus' name. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. The God of this world, you know, Demas, he used to believe everything that Paul the apostle said. And then something was telling him him or is uh, Paul the apostle God are you not making a uh, Paul your God he says ah then you are running you say B you are running and then you know he began to draw back and say that's true that's true I'm not going to make a uh, Paul my God it's a man like myself it's an apostle and then I'm also a child of God everything that Jesus did on Calvary that's theory my friend everything that Jesus did on Calvary he did for him he did for me also and eventually little by little the devil blindfolded him. I pray the devil will not blindfold you. And then it says, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shall shine unto them. You should be able to say like the Lord, the God of this world cometh, and he findeth he has nothing in me. Can you say that? The God of this world cometh, and he has nothing in me. The God of this world comes and has nothing in me. Where is that? Where is that? Where is that? John chapter 4, chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 30. John chapter 14. We're looking at verse 30. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me. You see, the devil came and he, and he showed that Jesus Christ all the kingdoms of the world and all the glories of the world. And he said, if you fall down to me, if you bend to me, if you're not consecrate to me, instead of consecrating to God, I'll give you everything. Look at what Jesus said and thank God when that temptation comes to you, you are going to be an overcomer. I said you will overcome. You overcome temptation. You overcome trial, you overcome all the presentations and everything the devil might throw your way. You're going to be an overcomer in Jesus' name. We're looking at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 5. Luke chapter 4, verse 5. And the devil taking, uh, taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the, of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore will worship me all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. Can somebody say that? Can somebody say that again? Say that from all your heart. Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That's what Demas could not say. That's what Demas could not do. That's why he left Paul the apostle, and then he went astray. He backslid. Thank God I will not backslide. We're coming to Philemon once again. Philemon, having only one chapter, I'm reading verse 2. Now, point number 3, divine ownership of sanctified fellow helpers 
by the master. When you realize that the master owns you, he owns your spirit, your soul, and your body. He owns your talent and your treasure. He owns your achievement and your skill. He owns your family and your possession. He owns everything he has bought you with a price. And therefore you belong to God and you belong to Christ completely, fully. For Lemos, uh, look at verse 2. It says, uh, and to a beloved apparel and Archippus, our fellow soldier, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house, and to the church in thy house. The man said, I belong to God. My strength belongs to God. My money belongs to God. My property belongs to God. The house belongs to God. Everything I possess belongs to God. And the people of God are looking for a place they can assemble, a place they can worship, a place they can serve the Lord. They said, what, God has this place already. It belongs to God. It's just that, you know, he gave it to me to manage. It belongs to the Lord. And he gave it to the, the church in thine house. Look at all of us here. And look at all of us in all the other places. If there's a church in that house, a church in that house, a church in that house, what do I talking about that we're going to have believers in every house in every city it will happen I said it will happen. But you know, it's not just talking about it. It's not just praying about it. It's not just wishing it. It is saying there's a house there. That's where I live. If I need to repack my things, if I need to gather my things together and move to a smaller place, this place is for the gospel. This place is for the preaching of the word of God. It says to the house, in the, to the church in the house. You want to understand, it was not only uh, Philemon that had the church, in his house. Look at Colossians chapter 4 verse 15. In Colossians chapter 4 verse 15 it says salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and in Nymphas and the church and the church which is in his house. That's another person there. These are people that understood divine ownership. I belong to the Lord. Everything I have belongs to the Lord and therefore I'm not you know trying to you know cut the thing and then I give a one percentage to God and then they make announcement make announcement okay I increase it to 5% and they keep on making announcement and the thing is there and I'm um, you know, just tacking it up in the bag and then we're giving we give everything we give property and we give everything we've got because we understand about divine ownership look at uh, Romans chapter 16 uh, in Romans chapter 16 I'm reading from verse 3 Romans chapter 16 uh, we're looking at uh, verse 3 it says here in verse 3, yeah, this last chapter of Romans, it says a great Priscilla and Aquila, my, what does it say? My helpers in Christ Jesus. Isn't it wonderful? Priscilla, a woman, the wife, and Aquila, a man, the husband, both husband and wife agreeing together. And then Paul, the apostle, in introducing them and giving their name in an inspired writing that is going to be preserved for thousands of years. And it says, a great Priscilla and great Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life, lay down their own necks. Think about that. These are the people that said, well, I belong to God. My spirit belongs to God. My soul belongs to God. My body belongs to God. And when Paul got into persecution and he got into problem, they didn't turn away and abandon him and say, I don't want to be identified with him. Because now, this is not, uh, you know, an easy time now. We don't know what the Roman government will do against him. They're taking him away now, and they might, you know, cut his head off any time. They're identified. Yes, yes, we're with him. Yes, we're with him. We're preaching the same thing. We believe the same thing. We follow the same Lord. We follow the same Christ. And he says, they laid down their life. And he says, who for my life laid down their own necks unto God? Whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Look at verse 5, the first line of, of verse 5. Read it out aloud. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. These were people that laid down their property. And they knew that God has divine ownership on everything they had. Greet the church that is in their house. I pray that this will be a commitment in Jesus' name. Before you come next week, you have done something about this. 
I said before you come next week, you have done something about this. Then you see this one is available, this one is available, and the church will multiply within this month and then within this year before the year runs out through what you submit and through what you give and through what you surrender in Jesus' name. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 16, and I'm reading from verse 15. First Corinthians chapter 16. Reading from verse 15, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanas, that it is the first fruit of Achaia, and that they have, look at this, they have, what's the next word there? They have, tell me out aloud, they have, if you are there, say it out. They have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They have addicted themselves. It's like they are drunk with desire to serve God. They were drunk with desire to consecrate more. How can I consecrate more? Any need over there, I want to give. Any need over there, I want to just splash my life on the, on the work of God. I want to spend and be spent. And it says they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints that ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth us, fellow helpers, helpeth us and uh, laboreth. Helpeth us and laboreth. We're looking at Second Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter 8, I read from verse 22. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 22. It says, and we have sent with them, our brother, whom we have often, often times proved diligent in many things. Not just, you know, diligent in this. Who can ask me for another thing now? Because, you know, I've been, you know, diligent in this area. My brother, look at another area. God has gifted you. God has talented you. And God has equipped you. And you can do this. You can do this. You can do that. Don't you see a Paul the Apostle? He was an apostle. He was a pastor. And he was a teacher. He was a leader. He was a writer. And he was a traveler and was an evangelist he went on about don't you see timothy timothy was a pastor and timothy was also like a missionary going here and there and timothy was a teacher he was raising up leaders you can give all your talents everything you've got you cannot just stay in that little corner and say i've done this i've done that you will do more I said you will do more. And everything you do will prosper in your hand in Jesus' name. It says, and we have said to them, my brother, whom we have oftentimes been diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence that I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper, and fellow helper, fellow helper concerning you or our brethren. Brethren, be inquired of. They are messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. I pray that God will use every one of us to the limit of our talent and the limit of our possibilities in Jesus' name. In Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 7. Colossians chapter 1, verse 7, it says, As she have also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servants. You see many of them, many of them, not just uh, you know one person overloaded, not just uh, one person that is doing everything and then we cannot find other people. It says over here, Epaphras, our, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Colossians chapter 4 Verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. Always laboring, not, you know, haphazardly, not once in a while, not occasionally, not only at the weekend, not only when he's free. No, the, the work of God is number one. And what he needed to do for the kingdom was number one. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. Always, always, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Look at verse 13, for I bear him record that he has a great zeal for you. He has a great zeal for you. 
That's not the limit. And for them and them that are in Laodicea, that's not the end. And them in Hierapolis. You know, some people, once I look at my little thing here in this district, that's all I can do. Once I look at the little thing here in my group, that's all I can do. No, you can go further. All the people will see as examples here. These were people that sold themselves, committed themselves, and totally gave themselves, addicted themselves to the work of the Lord. And your own time has now come. We are fellow servants, we are fellow laborers, we are fellow workers, we are fellow builders, we are fellow helpers, we are fellow soldiers, we are fellow reapers, and we are fellow um, servants of God, with the apostle, with the leader, with the overseer, with the pastor. The apostle and the associates all labored in unity because they all had one understanding and they all had the same conviction and they had the same definite experience of divine ownership. As Paul the Apostle went to the Lord in prayer and said, Lord, I lay down everything. Everything I've got, everything, every influence I have, all the position I've got, I lay everything down. So all these associates, they did the same. They were not just looking at, well, that's Paul, that's Paul. He had his own commitment, he has his own calling, he had his own vision and all that. But they all did the same thing. We're going to do the same thing in Jesus' name. The same God who is the Lord of harvest is the Lord of each harvester and the Lord of every reaper, every helper. Paul and the fellow servants watch like the new. They were laborers together with God. They were workers together with God. And so are we by the grace of God. Such conviction will keep us faithful. Such conviction will keep us obedient. Such conviction will keep us selfless as fellow servants, as fellow helpers, and as uh, fellow laborers in the kingdom of God, not only at this time, but for the rest of our lives. We'll walk with God. I said we'll walk with God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 9. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 9. Look at what it says. It says for we are laborers together with God. We are laborers together with God. The same God that called Paul the apostle. The same God that called Timothy and Titus. And Tychicus and Philemon. And all those people. That same God has called us. The same Serve their own generation. These are generation, and we're going to serve without looking back in Jesus' name. In Second Corinthians chapter six, I'm reading from verse one. Second Corinthians chapter six, reading from verse one. It says, "We then, as workers together with him, we then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that she receive not the grace of God in vain." We'll serve the Lord. I said, "We'll serve the Lord." Make it personal. Say that out aloud. And you are going to lay everything on the altar. You are going to serve the Lord. All the carefulness of the past, all the retardation of the past, all the pulling down of the past, everything will be solved here tonight. And you are going to call upon the Lord and say, Lord, afresh, as if I never worked before for you in the kingdom of God, I'm going to start today. And everything I've got, I lay down property and life and everything I'm going to lay down and serve the Lord without looking back. It will happen in Jesus. Jesus name and the Lord will make this work to prosper in your hand in our hands together there'll be unity there'll be oneness and we go forth in partnership as fellow helpers in the ministry of the kingdom of God let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer open your mouth and don't disturb other people don't shout uh, so much that other people cannot concentrate and pray and don't uh, you know clap your hand or whatever don't do any of those things let's be serious and let's give ourselves to the lord and say lord i come to lay everything on the altar and i want to really serve you i want to forget all the excuses of the past and lord now i come i give myself completely and i'm going to serve you open your mouth and pray and tell the lord serve the Lord with new strength and new energy.